So this is the profile about myself. Okay, so I am Karthi, uh, working as the product secretary in Logitech. So hope you know about Logitech. Right? So we are uh, the leading manufacturer for the keyboard, mic, gaming accessories, and uh, team educators accessories and software. So currently I'm taking care of like uh, DevSecOps, Apache security, and then uh, cloud security and cloud data security. So uh, I'm closely working with engineering managers and leaders to make sure the products are uh, built up in a secure way. So these are my certifications that are on my hand. This is CH and AWS security, these are certificates I have. Right? But it's areas like pen testing, there's a cost from cloud security. Pen testing is nothing but a kind of uh, upper way of security. I mean, we made this web apps, mobile apps, APIs, IoT devices, hardware devices, whatever it is. So we will do pen testing in, in, for each and every tech stack. And also, I'm um, leading the Chennai, Law of Chennai chapter leader. So we are conducting the app like this, we are conducting regular meetups in Chennai. Even uh, even if you are from outside, uh, right, also you can join through the Zoom or something like that. So maybe we probably set up the meetup next month, so you can join in there. You can find all these details in the WoWs page itself. Okay. Uh, so this is my LinkedIn profile and contact. Okay, let uh, before just getting to the verification attack, I just want to give some idea about what is verification, how the architecture will be there. Okay, this is how the typical modern application infrastructure works. Okay. So first the user, then firewall, then proxy, then web server, then that will be the business layer, data layer. This is how the typical web application stack works. So whatever the things you are seeing right now in the internet, right? Ah, that's what I'm just thinking about light. So this is how the typical modern of web application will work. Okay. So previously the application will have three tier architecture. That is user, uh, web server, then database server. This is how uh, the application architecture will be in, uh, developed in the previous session, right? Uh, we call that as monolithic kind of application. Nowadays, the monolithic application has been migrated to microservices based application. So, for each and every functionality, we have some separate, separate microservices. Uh, so, you can think about why microservices from monolithic to microservices. You can see uh, data actually like Netflix, Amazon, because they are just dealing with millions and millions of transactions every day, right? So, they want to scale up. So, in order to scale up, they just migrate from monolithic to Microservices based application. Microservices in the sense, each and every functionality will run as individual application. Like, for example, authentication will run as a separate entity, and then business logic will run as a separate entity. Like that, uh, maybe like depending upon the application and the, I mean, the app size, the microservices range will be increased. For Amazon, it will be more. For Netflix, it will be more. Compared to some of the small scale companies, it has some 10 to 15 microservices. But if you are dealing with some millions and millions of customers, then microservices count will be increased. Okay. This is how the typical architecture will work. Firewall, the firewall will be the first layer you will try to interact whenever, uh, wherever it is Flipkart or Amazon, whatever it is. Firewall is going to be the uh, thing between us and the web server because it's going to block the request and it's going to allow the request. After that, it will be like proxy. Proxy in the sense uh, to load balance because uh, in Flipkart, some sale is coming. Okay, one day, okay, okay, okay. everyone will try to write. The server need to handle the request, right? So, the proxy will be the middleman. It will try to route the thing to the server which is free at that time. So like that they will use the proxy or we call it as load balancer. Okay. And then we call this web server. This is where the UI things will come into play. I mean whatever things you are seeing in the screen, right? Images, uh, uh, cascading style things, HTML, whatever it is. Whatever you see in the front end page, all these things will be residing over the presentation layer. In business layer will be the core logic will be that authentication and then product searching or payment related things. All these things will come in the business layer. Data link layer in the sense, it will hold the data, our name, address, credit card numbers, password, whatever it is, what are the information we are just giving to the uh, inter that particular website, it will get stored over the data layer. Again, uh, there are a lot of technologies will be there each and each and every layer. Okay, this is like this is the modern infra tech stack as of now. It may be the on-premise or it may be the cloud. In case of AWS, each and everything will have some kind of AWS service running over there. For example, for database layer, AWS, RDS. Uh, AWS S3 buckets will come into play. In terms of business layer, Lambda functions, and then easy solutions that will come into play. In terms of proxy, AWS Firewall, in terms of uh, uh, proxy, load balances, ECB, uh, AWS ECB come into play. So just think about that. These are like common architecture. It can be implemented in on-premise as well as in the cloud. So depending upon where we are passing, the service will change. But the common architecture will be the same, irrelevant of whether it's on-premise or in the cloud. Okay. So this is how so what are the requests the user is giving? It has to pass through these three layers. Okay. So 
different kind of technologies. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of, uh, I mean, we would have an idea about the developing things, right? Um, someone will call us full stack developer, someone will call them as back end developer, someone will call them as uh, front end developer, or uh, UI UX designer, we call them some different name, right? So, the front end technologies are predominantly used with the front end developers, okay? Uh, uh, ultimately, in front end, if you come with a, uh, if you come into a picture, the only one language is JavaScript, okay? Because that is the only language your browser will understand. Java, PHP, .NET, whatever it is. That no thing will come into play in terms of browser, okay? The browser will understand only three things. This is the fundamental you have to understand. Even if you go into any website, just right click the website and uh, right click the website the mouse, you can see a thing called web page source. If you see the web page source, you can see only three things. One is HTML for the elements. Second thing is for CSS for the beautifying the things, font size, color, everything. Uh, and then JavaScript to interactions, okay? You have to do interaction with the website, right? So for that purpose, you use the JavaScript. It, the browser doesn't know anything, whatever you get is a backend, whether it's Java, PHP, again, uh, it didn't know JS, Express, whatever it is. The browser doesn't understand anything, it just understands everything. Uh, why I'm just iterating this point again and again, then in order to trust your application, you should have some understanding about this thing. Okay, these are the some front-end technologies, uh, uh, some frameworks. We, call, uh, we, can, we don't call this a technology, it's a frameworks. Vue.js, Angular, React, these are popular uh, uh, JavaScript frameworks. If you, if you want to become a printed developer, you could be expert in any one of these frameworks. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you are, probably the React is developed by the Facebook. Same as like Angular is developed by the Google, right? So each and every company will be comfortable with one kind of uh, frameworks, okay? First the thing is, what are the frameworks? The primary common point is JavaScript. So you have to first fundamental, you have to good with the JavaScript. Then you have to learn any one framework, then you can move on to the next frameworks, okay? So if you see any modern websites, okay? If it's legacy website, it will be have only two things, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. If it's going to be a modern website, it, have, it will have only within these three frameworks, okay? Uh, Facebook is developed in React. Netflix, again, Netflix also React, okay? Uh, I, uh, likewise, each and every company will have some kind of taste in the framework. But this is the concept uh, behind the front-end technology. These are the back-end technologies. So if you want to become a back-end developer, you have to learn any one of these skills. Like uh, Node.js, it's again a framework which is uh, uh, which is behind the JavaScript. Okay, again Java, Python, PHP, Laravel, Go, Ruby, .NET. Apart from this, there are so many languages also. The Flutter, Flutter is a front-end framework which is common across all platforms. Maybe desktop application, you can develop with web application, you can develop uh, with uh, mobile application, whatever it is. Flutter will be a common framework. Underlying language is called Dot. Dot is again a new language which is similar to Java. Okay, there are a variety of languages in there. Even in a single company, they can use lot of languages. Uh, for example, uh, in my previous company, like Facebook, we used to, uh, uh, I mean, used to work on various languages like Python for microservices, backend services, uh, Ruby on Rails. Again, Ruby on Rails is one of the, so that's uh, again, that's the one, another framework. So the company will use the frameworks and technologies depending upon the use cases. Okay, if it's going to be very secure banking kind of applications, they always stick with Java. If you want to uh, develop your product very rapidly. You have to come quickly in the market. You have to use Node.js because that is very easy to develop. If you want to uh, develop very secure product, then you have to go for Java. If you are predominantly going to work with only dot, uh, Microsoft related services, then you have to go to .NET. Okay, but .NET is uh, while uh, like uh, around seven years or eight years ago, but there are only two languages that are predominantly if you go anywhere, Java or .NET. That's the only thing. But nowadays we have a lot of options. Apart from this, Go also slowly, rapidly developing. So each and every language will have some kind of pros and cons. So depending upon the pros and cons, the company will decide on which language they have to go and design the product. For example, Go will have some kind of processing speed is very high compared to it's really uh, it's really fast as compared to the C level language. So in my company, in my company logic, right? We use we don't use these kind of technologies. We just use C C++ because we are closely working with the hardware products. In hardware, you have to talk with the hardware design. Some language will be very powerful. It has to be, it, it should have some capability to talk directly with the hardware. So C is the ultimate language to talk with the hardware very powerful. So that's why for big, big companies who are dealing with hardware, they predominantly use C++ also for gaming related companies. They will use C++. So depending upon the company, nature, product, they will use the technologies and products. Okay, why I'm just giving this introduction for publication attack and sense? 
uh, if you are going to track, uh, suppose if you want to rob a bank, just consider that if you want to rob a bank, uh, will you go, uh, I mean, directly to the bank and just throw the uh, gun and you will throw, okay, I am going to hijack your bank or something like that. Otherwise, you will get caught, right? Same as that, if you want to break any kind of application, first you should understand exactly what technology the web has been developed. Because, as I told, each and every tech stack will have some kind of vulnerability. Okay. Uh, for uh, uh, if you are developing an application the React, some kind of attacks won't happen in the React. If you are developing an application with Java, some kind of some kind of attacks won't happen in the Java because uh, each and every language will have some kind of weakness. So first thing is you have to understand exactly if you are going to test a web application or going to attack a web application, first you need to understand in what language, what is the front end, what is the back end, how exactly the application is working. So you need to know each and everything. So that's why this kind of fundamental is very, very necessary to attack and web application. Not only a web application, mobile application, uh, whatever it is. You should first know the technologies where it's exactly running. Again, uh, sorry, I think the color is not clearly visible. So this is how the typical modern architecture would work. Okay. The first thing is okay, the first thing is use the browser. This is where our 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 node exists, okay, as a user. Okay. Then it goes to DNS. So how many of you know about DNS actually? What for what purpose are we using DNS? What? Right. Right. Okay. Uh, why do you need that service actually? So, I mean, for example, if you're typing www.google.com, do you know what is happening at the background? Right. So, the thing what will happen at the background is this. First, uh, when you, because as a human, you cannot be able to remove all the IP address of the system. There are millions and millions of systems on the website as I It is possible to remember all those IP addresses directly. That's why we need some kind of mechanism to resolve the name to easily be able to remember some name. It has to resolve to IP address. That's where the DNS server will come into play. So how the process exactly works in the sense, when you type an address in the address bar, first we will go and check in your local folder. <coughs> See system, Windows, system, Windows system that took ETC drivers. If you have Windows system, you just go and check over there. Okay. This is the folder, there the file name will be there, fast. But fast is the file name which will store, if you are going to store www.google.com and some IP address, the first irrelevant of whatever happened, your browser will go to the particular IP address. That's why whenever any virus or malware comes to your system, it will first attack the fast file. Because with that, if I you can able to change some IP without your knowledge, then I can able to re redirect to phishing website, same as like Google. Okay. So, OS is the first file your system will respect. If there is no entry, then it will check for the catch. Okay. If the catch also doesn't hold any information, then it will go for the DNS server. Obviously, the DNS server is your ISP, whatever it's at, geo, whatever it is. It will go and ask. Then it will go for .com root server. The .com root servers will respond back. Okay, I this is the I don't know about the IP address, but I know where you can get the information. So it will just redirect to the Google.com DNS server. So that DNS server will return back with IP address. With that IP address, again the request will go. Since we are using HTTP protocol, it will go with IP addresses, semicolon, port number 80 or 443. If it's HTTPS, it goes for 443. If it's HTTP, go for 80. This is how the resolution is happening, but it's happening at the fraction of Okay. So why I'm just iterating this point means uh, if you want to become a really good Apache hacker, Apache hacker, you should know each everything what is happening in the background. Without this knowledge, you're not able to Blindly, okay, I put some XSS attacks, something, okay, I can get away from it. That's not happening because even if you put, uh, if, if, even if you've got a lot of follow ups also, you cannot be able to crack a good interview and good, good progress company because whatever you are learning, just learn fundamentals and what's exactly happening in the background. Without the understanding, you cannot be able to move further beyond that point, okay. So once it is resolved, it go for the road balancer, then it go for the front end, then it go for back end, okay. Then finally, uh, these are like layers of dead things, CDN, cloud storage, storage, data warehousing, data analytics. Data warehousing nothing but, in Flipkart, uh, uh, suppose Flipkart after you are buying some items, right, uh, the business has to develop. So, the business will always focus on your data, okay, which product you are really passionate about. For example, if you are girls, you are looking for some beauty related products, okay, how many percent of uh, girls are looking for these products, how many percent of girls are looking for these products. So they will collect all this information at the background, see, uh, I mean background. They will do some analytics. That is called. That is where the another engineer will come into call business analytics engineer, uh, data analyst. They will play this kind of role. They will just collect all this information, the data warehouse, 
then they will do the data analytics and re analytics. With this information, they will improve the business. Okay. So if you see in the Google also, right? If you do searching something, Google to Google for some product. If I'm searching bike with the product, suddenly I got bike ads around. Wherever I go, the bike ads will follow. If I go to YouTube, suddenly bike ads will come. If I go to True Color, bike ads will come. How? Because there will be a cookie which always try to track your preferences. They will keep on have eye what you're searching, what you're doing, what you're really interested in. So they are collecting all this information at the back end. So if I, if they are collecting this much information about a single person, then consider that how many information for the entire world they need to store. So that is where the data arrows and business intelligence analytics will come into play. Okay. And then um, obviously they will store all the data, the SQL, no SQL. Then for catchy purpose, they will use Redis, MKG. These are like some latest technology to speed up the process. These are like these are not the fully database, but it will try to store like RAM. In our system, RAM is there, right? They must like uh, this cache will store the temporary uh, details over there. Okay. So before getting into this uh, uh, HTTP, uh, oh, HTTP, I mean, I mean web applications. Uh, these are the HTTP request and response headers. So how many of you seen this kind of things in your browser? Did you ever get chance to see these things in your browser? Okay. Uh, if you go to, uh, mostly you won't, you won't see this in the UI. Okay. If you see in the developer tools, in browser we'll have some, some kind of section will be there, right? Developer tools. If you go there, if you click the network, you can find this request and response header. Okay. This is how the application works. Okay. So how the application works in the sense, first, it will have some kind of method. Then it will have the URL. You can see that okay, this is not the URL. Okay, you are giving something, right? www.amazon.com slash products slash maybe like your vacuum cleaner or something like that. The www.amazon.com is a domain slash products slash uh, vacuum cleaner. This is the this is the exact URL you want to visit. That's that's why here you can see right dot net dot fruitless.com slash fruitless. That's the entire URL. But actually, the dot net fruitless.com is a host. Okay. So the first thing is method, then path, then protocol. Protocol is HTTP protocol. Okay, HTTP protocol. Um, and then you will have some how many of headers will be there. Or user agent. User agent is nothing but what exactly the user agent you're using. We're using browser. It will go the information in, in, in this section. Mozilla, you're using what kind of browser? Chrome or Mozilla Firefox or Internet Edge. Or whether you're using inter, uh, whether you're using mobile applications, okay, that is the user agent exactly, okay. And then accept language, accept encoding, that the key for connection. These are there are so many addresses. There. If you go to uh, if you just put in Google request address, you will get lot of information around 200 to 300. Each and everything will have some kind of meaning, but you have to understand the important header because not just a web application. These are also the key points because each and everything is a parameter to the web application. It doesn't, we are not sending some scrambled data here. Each and everything is a data. Each and every header will have some kind of meaning. And just request header is nothing but what a browser is actually sending to server. Response header is nothing but what the server is referring back to the browser. This header is not for us. Okay. It doesn't mean for the user. It is just for servers and browsers to understand. The browser is sending some information to the header, which is actually targeting the server to understand. Okay. The server is sending some address in the response, which is actually targeting the browser to understand. So after in this request, I'm just uh, the browser is telling to the server that this is the host I'm trying to hit, this is the URL, this is the user that I'm using, these are the language and these are the encoding set I can accept. Okay, these are the formats I can accept. Please send the message accordingly. So I'm just giving some information to the server to talk with me directly. Then server is okay. Server is sending that okay, this is the server, what kind of technology I'm right now running. I mean, if you see here, the server will display, the server display will give some kind of information about the web server exactly running over there. If you are, if they are running the .NET based application, here you would have get ASP.NET. Okay. If they are running some Nginx server, you will get Nginx. So here you can able to see exactly what kind of server they are using. With that also, we can get some information, okay, what exact technology is running over there. If it's .NET server, obviously .NET application is running over there. Okay. If it's engineering server, then obviously Java is going to run over there. Like that, you will get some meta information. Okay. Then it will, it, it just telling that X powered by, telling what kind of framework or what kind of technology I'm exactly using. Okay. Then expires, it uh, catches the content type. Content type is what kind of content I'm serving. If it's PDF, 
it will have some kind of PDF format, it has zip format, it has some different format. If it is like, uh, if it's going to be like uh, uh, some kind of JSON format, you have some kind of other content type. Okay, depending on the content, what the exact server is serving, the content type will change. Okay, so why I'm just giving this thing very important for you, listen, because this is the only thing you are going to see in your proxy to test an application. You are not going to test or attack a web application by with the browser. You are going to use some kind of proxy tool. The proxy tool will have only this kind of information. So you should understand very well. Okay. Because uh, you should, if you know these things very well, then you know where to inject some kind of payload. How you can able to hack and web application. Okay. So I am just giving some example over here for that, that question and response letters. If you go to Mozilla Firefox software documentation, you can find all the list of request letters, all the list of request response. I will, I will just give some practical, anyway after we have practical scenario, right? I will explain all those while we are seeing the demo, right? And then as I told, there is a method as the first thing, right? Get method, get method, put method, post method, these are the methods. HTTP is a protocol. What is a protocol first of all? Protocol is in uh, some, some kind of strict, strict things we need to follow. Okay, if I have, if I have, I have to come to a certain college. I have to come this kind of uh, uh, formal terms. This is a protocol which I need to follow. Same like protocol sense, server and client need to talk with each other. They should follow some kind of standards between them. If I want to talk with you, uh, if I, I cannot able to talk with Tamil, right? Because someone will know Tamil, someone will know English, someone will know Hindi. So I need some kind of common language to talk, which everyone can able to understand. So likewise, server and client need to talk with each other. They should have kind of some kind of methods to follow. So these are the methods will be used in the HTTP protocols. Get method, get method, put, post, patch, trace, option, delete. But mostly you would have seen about the get method and post method. Okay, get method in the sense, whatever the parameters you are sending, it will, it will be displayed in the URL itself. If you try to search in the Google, anything, you can see the URL. Whatever the keyword you put it in the Google space bar, it will be displayed over the URL itself. Because what are the parameters passing in that? Uh, URL is a sense, which is why it's called get method. Then post method. Post method where it will be utilized in the sense if the parameter is going to be sent in the message body. Okay. Message body in the sense. Uh, this is the header. After that, a space will be there. After that space, what are the parameters we are passing? It will move on. Okay. That is the message body. Okay. So, uh, uh, for example, in, in Google or Gmail something, you are blogging, right? You are giving user a password. So, did you see anywhere that username and password is passing in the URL? Right? You cannot able to see your username and password passing. Because why? In the sense, because whenever you are getting any sensitive information from the form, something like that, they will always implement the post method. Post method in the sense, parameters will not pass to the URL, it will be passed to the message body. That you cannot able to see in the UI. You, if you want to see in the sense, you have to see in the network. Again, developer tools, network, you have to see each and every request, there you can find the message body. Okay. So, likewise, it is used to just get the headers only. It is a method. Most probably used to get the headers only. Then, patch, trace, option, delete. Mostly, in put method, sense, again, if you want to update anything, if you want to update your address, update your uh, phone number, something like that, already you have logged in, you have given some details, you just want to update some details, right? In those cases, only they will use put patch method. So, if you are really working on the API, you can see this method, how if I tell you to get it. But the right now, just think about that. Get method in the sense, your parameters will pass the URL. Post method in the sense, your parameters will pass the message body, you cannot able to see the UI. Just that is more enough. If you want to get more detailed information about this method, just go and listen again, go to the documentation. You can see in what use cases these methods will be applied, what the purpose. These are the only methods which is available in the issue protocol, right? This is also another fundamental you have to learn. Next, status codes. Most probably you would have heard about status code, right? Suddenly your website, when you are trying to interact with any website, you would have got 404 error. Or 404 formatted, something like that. You are getting some kind of message, like you usually would have seen about 404 only because that's the only thing that will be displayed in the UI. Remaining these kind of codes won't be displayed in the UI. So the other, that's why you didn't know about this code. Okay. Actually, these are the codes, each and every code will have some kind of meaning. The browser will understand. Okay. 401 is unauthorized. 403 is forbidden. 404. Not found. That means not found in the sense, whatever the resource you are trying to get from the server, it is not found in the server at all. 403 unauthorized in the sense, the resource is there, but you are not authorized to access that resource. 401 forbidden, something is wrong. I cannot able to serve the server. So, like that, each and every code will have some kind of meaning. 
why I'm giving, uh, why I'm just telling this code in a sense, when you're trying to do some kind of brute force attack, with this code you can be able to filter which is successful attack. Suppose I'm trying to crack any kind of verification of the password, multiple passwords. Uh, I cannot be able to go and see each and every request which is a successful attack. Okay, so I'm just sending 1000 requests. Out of 1000 requests, I'm getting 700 or 800, 400, 400, 400, that means these requests are not successful. But I, I just got only 10, 200 requests, that means successful attack. That means something has happened correctly, that's why I got successful response from server. So I can be able to go and see that particular request. Now I can see that password has been cracked. So that's why with this code, you can understand whether your attack can be successful or not. You can be able to filter the things with this code. So you have to understand the meaning. 300 is redirect. You could have seen this some, maybe you, uh, maybe you could have, this is, will happen in the sense, when you are trying to log in any application, you have to go to the home page, right? First you are just giving username password, it is going to get the username password, uh, it, will, it will just check whether you are authenticated person or not, once you are authenticated, it will just redirect to the home page, right? That the redirect is happening, right? Whenever, wherever the redirect is happening, there you can be able to see the 301 redirect, 302 redirect, this, this kind of thing. So, 300 series will always come into play whenever the website is redirecting you to some other page. Okay. 400 will come into play whenever the server cannot be able to respond back with some kind of information. 500 series, server error. You are giving correctly, but server cannot be able to process something happen at server side instance, you will get the 500 server error code. Okay. Then, 1 and 200, 200 successful, you will get mostly 200 uh, okay response code because it is going to be a successful one response code. Okay. So, you have to understand these codes very well because uh, <coughs> methods, codes, request and response messages, this is the only thing we are going to see in the app. Because if you have to understand only, you can be able to see, you can be able to uh, easily test an application with this thing. So, basically, what we are going to set up after all the sense proxy, bug suit. How many of you know about bug suit? I think very much. So, bug suit is nothing but the proxy tool, okay. Uh, I mean, it usually is set up between our browser and server, okay. Like, you can see here, right, this is our browser. This is where we are going to use our application. This is where the website is, okay. The web is going to be hosted in our local system environment. We are going to configure that as a proxy for our browser. So, whatever the request I am going to send from my browser, it, it, it just go to the web suit, it will stay there. When I am clicking forward, it will go to the server. Same as like whenever the response is coming from the server, when I am clicking forward, it go to the browser. So, we are just like, uh, we are standing in the middle between the website and browser. We are trying to understand the flow. We will see the flow. So, once you understand the flow, what is happening. So, uh, so if, if, if you are, if, if someone giving application to test, we cannot able to test just like that. First, we need to understand the application. We need to un uh, analyze what is exactly happening. Okay, whenever I am clicking, I log in, what is happening at the back end. So, first, First one or two days, you have to uh, just use the application like a user to understand all the functionality. Okay. Once you've done the recognizance or information gathering, then only you can think about okay, this is how it's happening, how we can be able to attack. So first you are using a proxy to just gather information as a starting point. So the proxy is going to be sit between the browser and server. We can able to configure in the we can able to configure in the network settings of our browser so that each and every request will go through the web suit. So, whatever the things I have learned, I have taught you the previous slides, right? That is the only thing you are going to see in this bug. Okay, you are not going to see any fancy UI or something, nothing is going to be there. So, in bug suit, you are going to see only the request and response status, status code, message body, what method you are using. This is, how, this is what you are going to see. That is why I just uh, taught all these things at the starting itself. Okay, so you have, in order to use bug suit or in order to use uh, uh, bug suit for testing, you have to be thorough with the previous thing. So, this is basically the bug suit component, okay, uh, like bug suit will have a lot of components will be there, maybe since I cannot be able to share my screen, right, so I cannot be able to uh, show the demo, okay, maybe I can, in afternoon we can see this component, that makes few sense, okay. So, how many of you know about the verbs? Okay, verbs are nothing but the like, same as like Wikipedia, okay, it is open web application security project. That's the full form of OAP. Okay, uh, it's a neutral kind of organization, same as the Wikipedia. Uh, um, the security peoples around the world, they can able to contribute. 
they can able to collaborate, they can able to develop. This is like a kind of Wikipedia, they are sharing information for others to get uh, benefit. So every three years once, they will list out top 10 verification attacks. Okay. Uh, based on the impact and based on the likelihood, likelihood means how frequently it's happening. So based on those parameters, they will list out the top 10 vulnerabilities. Even if you go for any interview after two years, if you want to become a pen tester or hacker or something like that, they will ask only this question first, what is Bob's top 10? Tell me about tell me about the vulnerabilities, how we will tell, how we will mitigate. Mitigate means how we can able to fix the vulnerabilities. Okay. So these are the top 10 vulnerabilities, broken access control, cryptography failures, injections, insecure design, security misconfiguration, server side exposure. These are like some kind of attacks purely based for uh, web application. Again, for API, there are separate categories that works API top 10. That is happening only for API related issues. Uh, OOPs, uh, uh, I mean, uh, IoT also is a separate OOPs top 10. Is there. So, based on the tech stack, they will fit out the top 10 vulnerabilities. So, we will see some of the vulnerabilities uh, which are really impactful, uh, which can give you a lot of information. Or we can, with the vulnerabilities, you can be able to hack the system or database or use the whatever it is. We are going to see only those kind of vulnerabilities today. Remaining things uh, will be like it's a vulnerability, but uh, so see, everything is a vulnerability, but there will be some kind of thing called impact. What you can do with the vulnerability? <coughs> Something will be high, critical, medium, low. Low and medium is fine, but if critical or high, you can do something with that. If there is a vulnerability called process scripting, process scripting is on your website, then I can able to hack your account. If there is excess in Facebook, then I can able to any, hack anyone's Facebook account. If there is a SQL injection vulnerability in the Instagram, then I can able to get anyone reads directly fed from the Instagram. If there is a red limiting vulnerability, uh, Red limiting vulnerability has been stolen in Instagram. So I can able to predict, I can able to crack anyone's password in Instagram. So uh, maybe these are like, uh, these things uh, may not be uh, very impactful if I am telling the vulnerability's name, but if I am comparing the vulnerability with some kind of brand name like Facebook, uh, Instagram, then you can know the impact very well. Because where the data is more, there the impact is more. Okay. So basically, we are going to see about first thing is process scripting. So, do you have any idea about first scripting? Uh, one thing I have told, right? First thing, first old basic thing I told. What exactly the browser will understand? The browser will understand only the thing uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Because the browser will understand only the things by fetching these things and by rendering these things, it's just showing all those things as a UI for you. Okay, you can see only three things: HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Maybe CSS code is not residing over here. It is just formed in terms of links, in terms of head section. So you can see here, link, some links will be there. It gets loaded dynamically. That's how the website will get formed. Okay. As I told you, if you can see here, I'm just scrolling here. For a single, uh, for a single request, you can see more tools, developer tools. You can see in the network, right? I'm just trying to refresh this website. Now we can see, right? In order to load a single website, this many requests are going to for this many requests, right? For HTML one request, for JavaScript one request, for this one request. You can, if you go down here with each and every request, if I go here, whatever I told you, you can see here, right? Response. Headers. You can see here, these are the headers actually we pass to the server. Okay. URL, get method. What method are you using? Get method. <coughs> so you would see this screen, right? Get method. Then status code is 200 working. Okay. That means my request is successful. Okay. Then you can see the content encoding, content security policies. Uh, again, that is one kind of header which is used for security related purposes. Okay. Then you can see here lot of headers are there. Content type, data, set cookie. Set cookie, set cookie is the right. X content type, this X access protection. Again, that's the one type of header used to uh, used to deal with the security related purpose. Okay. This is how a single request will have a lot of things. But in order to load the entire website, you are just given these many requests. Then response headers. If you see a response, this is a request header. This is a response header. This is a request header. What type of accept, language accept, encoding. So this is how actually any website will get worked out. Okay, okay let's come to the point. What is process scripting? As I told you, process scripting is nothing but uh, I told that browser will understand HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? So just think that, okay, I am a hacker, you are a victim, okay. Now I found that, Facebook, I mean Flipkart is 
are allowable to access us. I can send a link like this. Okay. Insecure object at some command, message to script, post email to user at that command. So you can see that I am trying to send one URL with some JavaScript. Okay. So access is nothing but, uh, for example, in your Flipkart, you are searching for some product. Okay. I am searching for mobile. I am just going to give the mobile as a keyword to search, search field. It will go to the server, it will search for the mobile, it will give back the results of mobiles, right? So you are given the keyword called mobile, right? That mobile will be reverted back in the response. So you can see, right? I have given the keyword called mobile, okay? I just sent to the server, I got the response for mobiles. Here you can see the keyword called mobile, right? Who given this keyword actually? We have given to the server, the server got the keyword and just put back in the response page, okay? This is the scenario. Now, just consider that instead of the mobile keyword, I am going to give JavaScript. Okay. The server will accept the JavaScript. It return back in the response with the same JavaScript as it is. But while trying to render the page, the browser will try to read one by one, line by line. When it sees the script, what the browser will actually try to Okay. They are wrote one some script. I am a browser. I can able to read the script. Okay. What is written over there, I will execute. This is called process. Exactly the sense. The server will accept the input. If the server at the back end, if the developer is not violating the input, if we are able to inject some JavaScript in the front end, if it just went to the server and just came back as it is without violating, if the browser can be able to execute the JavaScript, that is called process. Okay. Now you have to think that okay, where it will happen, anywhere it will happen. Wherever you have to think, you have to think in the imaginary way like a hacker. That's why you have to understand the application first. You have to identify the parameters. What are the parameters actually? It is getting from you. Name, search field, uh, username, password, uh, address, phone number, credit card details. In all those things, you are giving input. That means the input can be controlled by a user. So if you are going to give a script, it will reflect it back. If it is not validated properly, then the process will really execute. Okay. Uh, you can see that, okay, this maybe you would have yet in a simple case. But what exactly actually happens? If I am a hacker, I can I am good at JavaScript, I can write some key logic. So your browser will get to whatever you are typing, I can able to get to over there. I can able to steal your cookies. You are already logged in, I can steal your cookies because the uh, actually the process is happening in your side. So it can able to read your cookies. Cookies in a sense, how many of your own cookies are set in? Okay, first I will do uh, think about that. Uh, cookies in the sense, whatever you are seeing here, right? If you go to application, if you go to your cookies, for Flipkart, actually these many cookies are stored in your browser. Cookies are nothing but a temporary storage mechanism in your browser. Okay. What kind of things they will store in the sense, your preferences, your language, your Whatever you are giving as a setting, everything will get stored over here. First of all, one thing you have to understand HTTP is a status protocol. Status protocol is if you are going to give 100 requests, the server cannot be able to think about the okay, this is a request from Kathleen, this is a request from Bowman. You cannot be able to track each and every request because millions of customs are using the flip card. How we can be able to remember, okay, this particular exact request is coming from Chennai to Kathleen? How they can be able to track? So there should be some kind of tracking mechanism will be there, right? That's where the cookie comes into play. Okay. Even you are authenticated, you flip card, you are authenticated, right? You flip card, you are giving mobile name, OTP, something like that, you are authenticated. For each and every request, we are giving you uh, again the authentication, not like that, right? You are just giving only one time after login. Until you are going to log out, the flip card, you are just interacting with your account, right? How is the flip card able to help you? This is a request coming from your account. Because whenever you are giving username password, it will give back some kind of thing called session ID. That session ID will be stored over here. The cookie is just the vessel, okay? That vessel can store any details. In that in that vessel, they will store some kind of details called session ID. The session ID is actually identified till you log out, till you clicking the logout button. That is the ID, like kind of like kind of token. For every request, you have, once you have to give user a password, once the server given the token, you have to pass the token for each and every request. With the token only, it will identify you are there. If I am going to steal the token, I am going to give the server won't be able to differentiate whether you are given the token or I have given the token. But as a token, valid token I have given, so I can give the equal to you whatever you want. This is, called, this is how the hackers will hack your account using process tools. Okay, this example will show you the same thing.
in this example you can see right he is the victim he is just trying to log in now first thing what we have done is we have to find some accesses in that particular application if you want to hack some facebook account i have to find one access at least the facebook if you want to hack flipkart i have to find some access vulnerability in the flipkart account okay if i going to find that thing then i can able to uh, send i mean craft a link like this i can send over the chat but the only condition is the user should be logged in because once you logged out i can able to take the take a such id right so user should be logged in i can send the malcom the javascript the javascript will try to take the such id it will send back to me then i will put in my browser i will log in as me now i can go and change the password your account will be compromised this is how the process scripting will happen so if you want to know about more about process scripting you can use this website there are a lot uh, uh, there are a lot of kinds of process scripting there so this is the only website you have to group logic so excesses i just given only one example there are a lot of kinds of line excesses there uh, from uh, reflect excesses there stored excesses there down based excesses there so uh, even knowing only the single vulnerability you can learn a lot you can find so many websites with vulnerability to this so if you if you go to this website root excesses this website is only fully for excess vulnerability so in this website they will have demonstrated what kind of excesses how we need to so they also have some kind of playground you can able to test here okay just over here also they will let you know what are things you can do with excesses okay a lot of lot of blogs and articles are there you can just go over here and you can find this still if you want to know the practical case okay if you want to know the practical scenario what is happening exactly go to hacker one excesses report so only you know about hacker one the growth integrity okay this are like some kind of uh, platform which are created for hackers or anyone you can today also you can able to go and create an email account they will have some list of products i mean even we are also hacker one also hacker one hacker one if you are finding any excesses or any kind of bug in our product we will pay out some kind of money to you depending upon the severity we will pay out the amount we call we, uh, they call them such as bounty hunters a bounty hunters because lot of college people students even working for people will be bounty account is nothing but these are the platforms in there there are so many platforms like that hacker one bug cloud integrity these are some kind of platforms each and every company could have some security engineers in the company itself but still they want to some third id whether you would have missed something right someone can able to identify that that's why we are just asking our products in this platform if you are able to find some bugs and report to us if the bug is valid depending upon the bug we will pay you even freshox also is having a hacker one platform we are also in hacker one platform so some companies have been hacker one some companies with the bug loads some companies with the integrity if you have right kind of skill set you can start again now itself okay if you go to hacker one report for example that's a that's a cost scripting problem to start up okay and the report you can go to the why i am just showing the report in sense while reading the report only you can able to understand how other hackers found out so your knowledge will get improved so once learn one vulnerability at a time try to find the references try to practice then learn the reports related to the vulnerability you can see the payout right Is the payout here? We yeah, actually shown how we actually done the first scripting startups. Okay, like this you can read the report of so many reports. For example, reflect the excesses. So here they provided five hundred dollars. Since that's a low impact vulnerability. Okay, that's a low one. You can see here, right? This is a low issue, but still they offered five hundred dollars bounty. We know that because so we also offering around the. For low low bug, we are ordering. Uh, we are just giving five hundred dollars. If it's going to be critical, three thousand dollars. It's around two to three lakh per bug. Okay. If you are good at learning only process scripting or something like that, if you are able to find some bugs, some something like that, depending on the impact, they will pay you. So you can use this platform to learn as well as learn. Likewise, there are a lot of reports out there. You just you can learn because every hacker would have found in different different way. so you can while while reading the report you can get some idea about that so do you have any any doubts in process in what is the okay again process scripting is a very detailed topic okay just
think that you are giving some input, it just reflected back in the response. If you are able to ingest some JavaScript over that, if the browser can be able to inject the JavaScript, that is all perfect. Now you have to find the identity of all the input, you have to inject everywhere, try your luck or try to understand and do the thing. Either way you can do. Bug code you will test mostly what they will do listen, they will use the bug suit, try to automate, they will inject everywhere. Okay, they will do the processing attack. Somewhere they just get the alert, suddenly they will put in the hacker button. So this is how this how also you can be able to get the bounty. But you should have some kind of proper methodology to test the thing, otherwise you won't get such a salvage. So next important thing is exploitation. Okay. As I told you, all your data will be stored back, database, right? If I can able to hack the database, what would I have? Okay. If I can able to hack your Instagram database, what would happen? I can able to get all your mails, all your password, all your personal information. Okay, if I'm going to hack your Facebook, what would happen? I can able to see all your friends list, contact list information. That's called data breach. Okay. This exploitation attack mainly happens at server side. This is a server side attack actually. Okay. Client, mm, process scripting is client side attack, exploitation server side attack. Here we are not focusing on users. We are just here, we are just focusing towards the database. Okay. Whenever you again use any password like this, okay, just consider maybe we can see the demo, okay. Just consider that same same user and password because in every web application you are not going to do anything super magic and other. You are going to give same input as like a normal user, but you have to understand what is happening in the background based on that you are drafting your input. That's it you are doing. You are not doing in web application testing, you are not doing any magic system You are just understanding the application. Depending upon the functionality, you are just changing your input. That's it. If I know this input is going to send to a server, going to reflect back, in that particular area, I can check for task. If I know this particular input is going to go to the server, it's going to access the database, then in that particular input, if I can able to non form, I can able to get the exploitation. So actually, where your input is going to work out, if you know the logic, you can able to craft your input based on the data you have. That's it. Other than this, in low range testing, you're not going to you're not going to do nothing. You're just going to same use the application as like a normal user. Normal user will give name, password, username, address, phone number, you just go on, use the application, go on. But as a tester or a hacker, what you do? You will check each and every field. Okay, this field is going to interact with this particular component. What I can do? What how the thing will maintain? Okay. If there is a user it is going, like if I change to some other number, whether I can able to see some other user details or not. That's called IDA. Okay. If I'm going to upload a file, instead of normal file, I can able to upload some virus, virus or backdoor. If the server accepts, then I can able to hack the server. So this is how this is how the things work on. Okay. Same as like SQL is nothing but same username and password you are going to give. Okay, instead of the username and password is going to travel to the application, the application will construct a, select a, construct a SQL query like this. Select username, password, all the things, whatever you are given, it is going to sit over there in the query. That is how actually the query will run in the backend. Now, if I know this is the exact query you are going to run in the background, because I know some logic. Okay, if I can able to give an input which I can able to bypass this query, then I can able to, without username and password, I can to log into the application. Okay. For example, it's actually a vulnerable web application. Okay, you can just practice. Okay, even uh, after we are going to show demo in this application, I don't want to. Whatever we learned here, we can just see the demos over there. Just for uh, name site program, I'm just giving one demo. Okay. Now we can see the account, right? Account, login. Okay. So what exactly we are going to give here? So username and password, right? Uh, I'm just going to give some kind of username and some kind of password. Okay. Invalid email and password. That means the username and password is incorrect. Okay. I know that actually what is happening at the backend. Okay. Once I give the username and password, uh, as I told, uh, the username and password will pass to the uh, application. The application will pass to the query, database query. How the database query will listen? Select all from details where username equal to whatever we are given here and password equal to whatever we are given here. Okay. So whatever the parameters we are given, it is going to sit inside here, SQL query at the back. Now I know. So instead of username, I know that this is how the syntax will work. Okay. So what I can do in the sense, instead of username password, I am going to give here single quotation, hyphen hyphen case. I can give any password. Why I am giving single quotation? Like the back and how the query will, what are the parameters you are passing, it is going to 
uh, sit inside a single quotation in the SQL query. If I'm going to give one more single quotation, this single quotation and this single quotation will get paired. Uh, you would have surprised why I written I can I can I can I can distance. Um, uh, the application won't understand, but as per the database SQL language, I can I can means common. So it will omit the remaining queries. That means then the query will become select R from details where username equal to single quotation, single quotation, I can I can. This is the only query which exists back end. That means uh, I don't give any username, but the application will take the first username as the authentication. It will go on. Obviously, any application first username will be admin, right? So I can be able to login as admin. So just consider the thing, right? Okay, this is how it operates. Okay, uh, uh, but it won't happen more to your site. Okay. We want to find more uh, thing about SQL index in the real website. You can see a SQL index in now. So this is not the only place SQL index will happen. Even the query parameter itself will happen. Okay, if you want to find some real websites which are valuable to SQL index, uh, you can see you can use some kind of docs, Google Docs. How many of you know about Google Docs? What is Google Docs? I mean, we are using Google actually as a search engine, right? But Google has some powerful engine features as well. If you are going to give some certain kind of keyword and you are going to query, you will get exactly what you want. For example, I can able to get query about vulnerable servers. I can able to query and get uh, uh, get some uh, online candidate list or something like that. If you go here, if you want to go know all the docs, you can see here. PHP, Google Hacking Database. So this will have all kind of blocks which are used by the hacker. Okay. For example, uh, they want to find some they can go in my database. Okay, this is the this is the keyword I'm just trying to fix. Okay. If I'm going to give Google. Google. So you can see a lot of websites, right? Okay, we're going to pick any website. So I'm going to take any of it like this. But if you want to learn more of the SQL injection type, uh, because even SQL also we have a lot of types of uh, like uh, kind SQL injection, uh, second order SQL injection, a lot of things are there. If you want to learn more about those things, you can go to the first site, it will be easier. They kept some firewall in the But just note it down. You can, I can show those how those things can happen. <coughs> so 
So basically you understand what is the principle, right? So another thing, another uh, most classic vulnerability is the CSR cross site request project. Okay. Cross site request project in the sense uh, without your knowledge, I can able to make a request on behalf of you. For example, if you are, uh, uh, for example, if that, there will be a lot of functionality in the application, right? Changing your password, changing your email address, okay? Uh, changing your uh, phone number, something will be there, right? Just consider a scenario that, okay, uh, if I can able to change your phone number without your knowledge, by giving my phone number, then I can able to hack your account, right? Because uh, with the phone number, I can able to click forget password, I can able to get OTP. With that mechanism, I can able to hack your account. But I can change your phone number without your knowledge. That is where the CSR will come into play. CSR has been cross at request project. Okay. Cross at request for instance. Basically, this attack, in this attack, what I'm trying to do is I first I need to know about the application. Okay, in the flip card, this is the page where I can able to change your phone number, something is there. I can also be a user of the flip card. I could know the request and response, what is actually working on. I need to craft a request. I need to cross some of the malicious objects. For example, I just need to understand whom you are very uh, what exactly you are interested in. For example, uh, I am a fan of Ajit, okay, I can create some kind of pages on Ajit, I can able to grab malicious payload inside the website. Once you are logged in, I can send you the website. Once all, you are already logged in Flipkart, when you are trying to open that link or website, automatically the script will execute at the back end, your phone number will get changed automatically without your knowledge. So this is called cross site request position. Okay, cross site request position. As I told you before, right, the browser will have some kind of ID or token called such name. Okay. Whenever you are authenticated, whenever request is flying from your browser, the browser won't think about that. Whether you create the request or automatically triggered by some bot or not. You are logged in, session ID is there, some request is going to hit the server for the particular uh, URL, then I need to send the token along with the request. This is how the browser will understand. So that, that is where the CSR is happening. Okay. I am creating it, I am just creating a malform request in some other website. I am making you to visit the website. Once you visit the website, Automatically, this request will start to fly. The browser will append the session token along with the request. Once the server got the request, okay, request, okay, they are they are telling us to change the phone number. Session token is valid. Okay, I can change the phone number. That's it. But you don't get you don't get anything in the UI. But it won't happen in modern navigation nowadays. But still, there is some way to bypass because nowadays we are not sending just form request. We are sending Ajax request. Ajax doesn't uh, uh, asynchronous JavaScript. Uh, it actually used to, uh, it is actually a query, I mean, uh, actually a request and uh, response to communication from it. It just used to update only the one section of the website. Previously and all, uh, uh, website will get loaded fully. If you go to the next page, the website will get loaded fully. Okay, but nowadays, there is no need to load the website fully because if you want to update only the particular part, you can send Ajax request back and it will update only the particular part. For example, the class, for example, cricket scoreboard. Okay, if you go to ESP, uh, ESP ticket website, whenever the score is changed, uh, only the particular area only gets updated. How it's happening? Because of Ajax. The entire, if, 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 I, if I want to load the entire website, then no one can able to get the score on right time. So that is called Ajax request. In those kind of, if, if the request is going in that way, then the CSR attack is uh, very less. I mean, you are not able to perform the CSR attack. But still, uh, it's a classical thing you can able to do. Maybe you can see some use cases here. What? Uh, what kind of CSR attack can happen? You go to hacker one. Full account capture using CSR. So this is also possible. Using CSR, I can able to take your hack your account. So here we he, he mentioned clearly what are the steps we actually created. We just we just drafted a request here. We just drafted a page here. We just placed a script in some other page. Once you visit the page, automatically you will get a student going to prompt up. You can see here, right? Just created an HTML page. Account takeover, then he created some JavaScript over there. Just trying to visit some URL. Just some user, you are the user session ID will Just trying to, this is the CSR proof code. Okay. So, he just created a POC, he make you to visit. Once it is done, it's over. He can take over the account. Likewise, you can see some. Other Add item to Kim card automatically. So, this is the attack. Depending upon the application functionality, you can do a number of things. If it's a flip card, I can able to change your phone number, I can able to 
uh, take your uh, payment address something like that. With that, I can able to get benefit. If we test it, sit or I have sit uh, Without the knowledge, I want to transfer money from your account. So, depending upon the application, attack for a severity will increase. If it's going to be normal of the SSM card, it's application, something like that. If I'm going to say something, nothing, I'm going to get anything, right? So, it depends upon the application impact will be more. If it's a banking application, if it's CSR, then I can do a number of things. I can make me as a beneficiary account. I can able to transfer the amount from your account without knowledge. So, depending upon the application and the functionality, the attack will change. So, that's why I'm just showing some kind of reports. So, the hacker, hackers reported to so many of it. Depending on the impact only, they are giving the amount. Here you can see the two dollars they are given for this. Because the severity is medium. Again, depending upon the uh, uh, product, the bug bounty amount will change. If you're finding single bug, if you're going to find single bug in Instagram or Facebook, their bounty will be more different, like thirty thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars, even one million dollars also they will have if the impact is very high. So, uh, so even if the product is very uh, small company, they can offer like this, depending upon the impact. Okay, so you have to choose your product. It's not like that. No one can able to find any particular product. If you have to stick with any one application at the time, first you have to understand the application very well. Some bug bounty hunters will stick on only one application, like. If I am a Facebook, if I am very uh, love about Facebook, I will stick with only Facebook bug bounty. I will work for them for over three to four months. I will try to understand the entire functionality. Once I understand the entire functionality, any new functionality comes, I immediately can able to act, I can able to get the bounty amount. So like this, how much time you are spending in one application, that much you can able to understand. That much you can able to think different scenarios. Broken authentication. So what are the vulnerabilities comes in the category in the sense? Uh, OTP password. Now we are nowadays we are getting OTP password for the mobile, right? Uh, do you think it, it, it uh, do you think it's not uh, uh, I mean it's not vulnerable or it's not able to it's not that much it's difficult it's it very difficult to track like that? No, because it is very difficult, but the developers won't implement it in a proper way, it can able to be done. For example, uh, I, I tested a lot of applications, one kind of banking application, so generating the OTP, I'm getting the OTP in the mobile, but the server response also I am seeing the OTP. You got my point, right? If you are going to give your mobile number, OTP will be generated. It actually, OTP will be come to your mobile number only. But the response is going to come into my browser, right? Because I have given the request and response window. The response, if I see the response, the bug code, not for the UI. In bug code or something, developer or something like that, I can see that OTP is also coming to the response. Now I can able to put the OTP, I can able to log in with your account. Because this, this, this is a developer mistake because they don't know how to implement it securely. And then some OTPs will have four digit or three digit only uh, length. If it's four digit number, then I can able to maximum 10,000 records I have to do, right? Maximum 10,000 records I can open, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7. I can try the combination. If I'm going to give 10,000 10, uh, 10, combinations, I can able to crack that OTP. If, if that is possible, if OTP has don't have time limit. If what? Within 10 minutes, I can able to give 10,000 records. If it's going to be six digit number, then I need some more time to have it. And maybe six digit means I need one lakh, one lakh combinations. But if the time limit is more, definitely I can do that. Time limit is less than some minutes or five minutes, something like that. Okay, you can understand, right? These are the various things will determine the determine the security implications. If any one of things is missing, I can able to find one way to track. If the length is four, I can do proof code. Time is less, I can do proof code. Time is small, if length is small, again I can be able to put those. If uh, rate limiting is not there, rate limiting is sense, nowadays if you are giving three times wrong password, you will be get dropped. If that functionality is not there, then that is a possibility I can do through those. So, we have developed also think all these aspects. So, we have to put some OTP as a valid test, uh, OTP should have some time limit, OTP should have some commonly randomly generated, it should not be predictable also. For example, some developers would Generate a OTP, some predictable way. Based on the time address, maybe the first two letters of mobile number, then time on the time it is generated. If you attack it, will try to observe all the OTPs. Once I know the pattern, how the OTP is generated, then I can able to track. So these are the multiple ways I can able to think. Okay, in uh, one uh, one different scenario I face. Okay, uh, I'm giving you a phone number. Uh, I'm just going for security question. Uh, I'm getting you are getting the OTP. That phone number is tied to uh, the phone number is actually. I mean, sorry, uh, I am giving my phone, uh, I am giving your information, okay. You just go to the next step, okay. In the next step, I am going to give uh, email address. 
in that system, I am going to be my emulator, not your emulator. Okay. Now, actually, the OTP is going to be generated for you, but another OTP is going to come for my mail. So, at the same time, you are going to get the OTP in your mobile number. At the same time, I am going to get the OTP in my emulator. So, I can only solve this problem. That is a multi step. So, some website will have multi step authentication. If the multi step authentication is not even the problem, this is also allowed. Okay, so in authentication, only a lot of if the password is, if the application is allowing the password, keep it as simple as that is. I want to get something like that. Then, put this can be easy to right? So, likewise, in authentication, there is a lot of things are there. Again, OAuth based authentication. How many of you know about OAuth based authentication? OAuth. OAuth is then recently every website is giving privileges to log in with your Google and existing Facebook account. You no need to create any new account, right? You create username and password enter something like that, or use your existing Gmail or login with Gmail or login with Facebook. That is called OAuth authentication. Actually, it's a big concept. Anyway, you just try to learn about OAuth. So again, there are also again some lot of things will happen. Uh, there's some flow will happen. If the flow is not implemented properly, again I can able to hack your account. So in authentication, uh, what are the test cases we have to do this? First, we need to uh, uh, when I'm getting any application, I will first do the authentication in the first place. Okay, I will try to pass I will do the good flows. I will try to find whether the uh, uh, event. For example, if I'm giving username password, if I'm giving username correctly, password wrongly. The application, some application will tell the password is incorrect. That means I will get the information that username is correct. That means likewise I can able to group those. Okay, if I want to find a certain college or what are the email addresses and everything or something like that. If I'm going to use I am going to generate random names, I'm going to do like this. The application is going to give this detail like this. Username is incorrect, password is incorrect. That means I can able to easily get the information. Okay, these are the username is in the these are the usernames are available, these are the passwords are available. Now I try to match and narrow down my attack. This is another use case. This is how I can able to test the application. Then OTP, uh, and then passwords, and then rate limiting. Rate limiting is uh, how many times, how many seconds, I mean, how many requests I can able to give a request to server. If the rate limiting is not implemented properly, recently in Instagram, due to rate limiting issue only, Instagram account got hacked. I think they, they awarded only around 30 or so. But the problem is, they are blocking the rate limiting, but they have some different time period. Uh, what we have done in the sense, we use cloud services, easy to instance. We just rotating the cloud service for every 20 seconds, something like that. So, some system will be only under request, immediately another system will pass up, it will be under request. So, IP address will be different. Now, they cannot able to talk with IP address. So, I can give 10,000 requests with different, different IP addresses and different combinations. Again, I can able to hack that. So, I can see a number of things. You can see, right? So, this is how we have to test an application. All these things will come under broken authentication. When information is closed in the sense, uh, uh, this is not actually critical part, but again, it may lead to some sensitive information. Uh, as I told you, a website will give some error codes, right? 402, 403, 401. Sometimes the website will expose error messages just like this. We call it as debugging phase. Like some scrap code will come into play. Actually, that should happen at the developer, development environment. It should happen at the production environment. Sometimes the application crashes, it throws some error message with the UI. That error message is will contain some sensitive like SQL queries, database passwords, exactly what text stack is running in the background. By getting all this information, I can able to narrow down my attack vector. That is called information disclosure. Again, uh, this won't happen just like that. We have to first the application. First the application means we have to test some junk data to make the application how we have to test the application how it behaves. Okay. With that, you are able to get some information. Again, and this is not the critical one, depending upon the information, what it exactly exposes to the UI. File upload, as I told, right? In file upload, uh, there are a lot of uh, applications allowing the file upload. You are uplo uploading your images, right? Facebook, profile photo, Instagram, page. So, everybody are uploading the files, right? File uploading should accept, actually, the developer should return in a way that he should accept only the file you want. For example, if I want to upload a profile photo, I should accept only the JPG, PNG kind of file format. Is it, is it right to accept the zip format? Is it right to accept the PDF format? But some applications will, uh, some developers will forget to do this validation. If the value is not done properly, then I can able to upload virus, malware, reverse shell, something like that. If I can able to get that path directly, we call that as reverse shell. Reverse shell means I can upload some PHP file. The PHP file will have some kind of admin kind interface setting. If I can able to upload the image, instead of image, I am going to upload this file. I can directly access that URL. With that, I can able to control the server. So, this simple 
case of file uploading issue, I can able to get the reversion and I can able to, I can able to access the server directly. So, uh, as a normal user, you don't, you don't have, you don't have imaging this kind of things will happen. Again, you have just same as that you are inserting an application, but depending on the functionality, we are thinking that you can create something. Okay, there are more than 200 to 300 million users there. Right? Okay, but I am just showing you basics of some. If you go to work or if you go to PW, you can find all those things. Go to PW, common weakness enumeration. They will list out all the things. What are the kind of vulnerabilities, what kind of damage is it happening? We call it as common weakness enumeration. So, uh, you can see the letters. Why is locked along the most things? So, you can say these are some kind of, uh, some kind of vulnerabilities or errors happening at the coding level. Cryptographic errors. Cryptographic errors, as you told. Random, if the, the developer have, don't have to generate the number randomly, like tokens. Random is anywhere, session tokens, encryption keys, password, whatever it is. If there is a failure, so that, is, that will be stored in the cryptography registry. Authentication errors, authorization errors, bad coding errors, behavior. So, we have all those things categorized in a different way. So, it will be useful for the developers who are, want to learn about the coding And if you go to uh, uh, WASP, or you can go to sports figure. You can get detailed information over there. So if you go here, go to academy. You can see all the whatever I taught you, right? We have some clear instruction and clear videos video. You go to work and see. They have some labs also, you can try and practice. Okay. They will explain to you everything, what is the thing, how it is happening, how does it so I just put those photos from here. Okay. Access proof of funds. What are the types of accesses? What is referred to consisting? Again, total consisting. So impact. What is the impact exactly? So you can get all those details and what need to done to be mitigated. So what are how to prevent it? So what are things which developer can do? So if you want to get into a company, you can be a product expert in here. It's not the only thing you have to learn how to attack. You should know how to mitigate because you have to work with the developers when you program. You have to tell the developers to fix the issue. It's not only it's not only job that we have to find the issue. You have to actually talk to the developer to fix the issue, to mitigate it when you need more. You understand the vulnerability. That's why there are so many bug money out there are not getting the jobs in these things because they're just getting eliminated the first or second round itself. Because they just understand how to attack, but they don't understand the concept. They don't understand what is exactly happening or how they need to mitigate. So without this knowledge, they're not able to survive. So whatever you are learning, just try to understand what is exactly the vulnerability. And how to test and how to mitigate. There are three tips you have to follow. If you go here, you can see a lot of things there. So uh, you can see a lot of bugs. I explained the connectors, the desired case along, tick tacking, wrong base, cross. There are a lot of problems there. Just try to learn from here. As well as they have some labs which is there, you can be able to access it easily. Only thing is you need bug proof test. So in after session, I will show you how to use the bug proof test for this. 